Is the short pin in? <laughs> <laughs> Wrong hole. Says the meeting is now streaming live on YouTube on my end. Oh. Yes, it's live. All um, right. Hold on. Now we need to send this link to Ooh. everybody else. It okay. looks like it's working. Oh, yeah. I see all of us. <laughs> oh, baby. We live. Oh, man. I feel so. <laughs> Man, we are we are professionals. <laughs> hey man, it's our first time. Yeah. No train by text, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, here we go. All right, I'm gonna back up. Looks like it's working. Y'all good? You all good? Yep. Tiger King is present. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everyone. So uh, a friend of all of ours made a case study. James made a case study about using a Pico scope to diagnose a Tundra. And a couple dealer techs, a um, couple Toyota dealer techs, we're, we're mentioning how they don't know how to use the software. So I just wanted to do a, a quick little rundown on basic uh, PicoScope software usage. It, PicoScope 6, because that's what dealer techs, uh, Toyota dealer techs have. Uh, but in the meantime, well, while I was deciding to, to make that, I talked Daryl and Nolan and uh, Tim. And don't John. know how to use the software. So I just wanted to do. Oh, crap. I'm getting back feed, but I wanted them to do case studies as well. So I guess I'll share my screen and we'll go into Pico Scope 6. So I have a huge, a huge delay. All right, there, there's just a huge delay. And this is, all right. So one of the first things I, I, I wanted to show or some of the basics I wanted to show was uh, your voltage scales, your time divisions and your, your sample rates in PicoScope. So when I first turned on this PicoScope in the demo mode, it was on uh, uh, 200 kilo samples uh, per screen, which, for the most part, just isn't enough. It's not fast enough. And your sample size is basically dots on the screen. And the more dots you have on the screen, the more clear your picture is gonna be. So anytime you load PicoScope, you're going to want to put it on at least a million samples uh, per screen. Now, what that will do though, is that it's going to reduce your buffer size. So here's your buffer window. Uh, so right now I have 31 uh, windows. If I increase this any more than a million, I start to lose um, buffer windows, which it, it isn't the biggest problem, uh, just something you need to be aware of. So I usually keep it uh, between one and two, sometimes, sometimes three. Uh, but that is what this MS means. I see a lot of guys when I say, hey, change your, change your time division. They always grab the uh, MS thinking it's milliseconds and it's sample size. Uh, so when you want to actually change your, your time divisions, it is this one here. Now I'm going to be honest with you guys. I don't use, I don't use PicoScope live often. Um, so a lot of times what I do is I just grab 500 millisecond divisions and then I'll pause the waveform and zoom in. So you can zoom in just with this button and click. 
not something most people do, or you can grab this one and click and zoom in as well. Uh, so you can look at your waveform zoomed in. Uh, now, why don't I look at things live? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I like having big buffer windows. I like to see if I miss anything while, while viewing things. Uh, let's just say I'm looking at this injector waveform and I have a really, really fast uh, a time division. I, I could easily miss one here and not be able to see it. So the big benefit with PicoScope is their ability to zoom. So I just let the PicoScope do all the work for me. Usually use a 500 millisecond division. And then I, uh, I just zoom in. Now, after you get your sample rate and your All right, I had to go respond on the uh, chat. Uh, once you get your, your sample rate in your sample, well, your sample rate in your uh, time division set up, you can adjust your, your voltage scale. Now, uh, for the most part, depending on what you're looking at, if I'm looking at a five volt circuit, something like a cam sensor, I'll have like a 20 volt division. Actually, for the most part, 20 volt divisions is kind of what I use for most simple circuits. Um, if you're looking at something like fuel injectors, you're going to want more voltage. But likewise, if you're using, if you're looking at uh, the voltage of a fuel injector, you're also going to want it to use an attention, attentiometer, an attenuator. I can't talk. I'm so screwed up. You got it, PJ. You got it, man. I got this so screwed up with, uh, YouTube screwing up. So an attenuator. So if you're using it, something with high voltages, you want to use an attenuator. Um, your, your fuel injector, when the field collapses, you're going to have over a hundred volts. So make sure you use an attenuator. But with all that being said, uh, I like my, most of my waveforms to take up about a quarter of my screen. So if I drop my voltage down, it's going to make my waveform look bigger, obviously. And if I make my voltage higher, it's going to make my waveform look smaller. So we were, we were talking about using an attenuator. And when you use an attenuator, just to get your voltage scales right, you want to click on this little A, all right? This little A will bring a drop-down menu where you can change different, uh, different things. You can multiply your waveform 10 times. You can multiply your waveform 20 times. Now, my attenuator is a 10 to 1 attenuator. So uh, I would click on times 10. Or you can click on this 10 to 1 attenuator here as well. Um, so just wanted to show these, these technicians who've never used this, the very, very basics of using the software. Now, I know Tim has a case study that he's going to share later using some of the rollers in the partitions, which is something I use pretty often. Um, so yeah, he'll go into that a little bit farther, but I uh, just wanted to show that. Now, if I change, I'm just using a demo software of Pico. If I change channel A to injector current, all right, so injector current is now popping up. Uh, you can keep your, your uh, current clamp on a voltage scale, most, most amp probes are 100 millivolts per, wait, 100 millivolts per amp. Uh, so my, my fuel injector here is pulling right around 100 millivolts. So it's one amp of current for my, my fuel injector. But if you actually want to see it in amperage, you can, again can click this A and change your probe to your current clamp. And that just froze my PicoScope software. Hmm. 
All right, I got it back up. So, uh, is there anything else you guys would like to see? And, and I just seen Han, Hans mention filters. I don't like to use filters either. We were talking about this before this went live. And uh, yeah, one, once you get comfortable using using a scope, you kind of look past all the noise. And I, I personally don't like using filters myself. So, so is there anything else you guys think I should talk about on this main screen? Uh, <laughs> I think you covered all the basic functions of it pretty well. Just uh, tell them they use an attenuator to actually tell it that you have one in there, a 20 to 1, a 10 to 1, whatever it is. Because if you don't tell it that, it'll be a screwy voltage reading. Yeah, yeah. If if you don't tell the scope that you're using a 10 to 1 attenuator, your voltage will basically be divided <laughs> 10 times of what it should be. What about selecting pro like different probes? Yeah, so if now obviously I use a WPS a lot. Uh, so I would change my channel A or B, whichever my transducer is hooked up to. I would just pull my drop down menu down and I would click on which range it is. Now, if you've never used the transducer, it actually has, well, let me find it. It actually has three ranges built into it. And you can pick uh, the three different ranges, uh, range one, range two, and range three. Now, range one is negative 15 to 500 PSI. Uh, range two is negative 15 to 50 PSI. And uh, range three is plus or minus five PSI. So just something, something to keep in mind uh, when you're picking these different probes. Now, it isn't often I use uh, secondary ignition probes working for Toyota. I don't, I don't get the luxury of looking at secondary ignition much, uh, but I know Daryl, Daryl is starting to, to a little bit. Um, so Daryl, you have any like insight on the secondary ignition probes? Um, I mean, I use, I just use the, the cop wand, but I use just select it. I kind of just been toying around with using a trigger or not using a trigger, but I don't know. I don't have, I don't have too much experience using it yet. I think one thing with, um, with, you know, if, if people are new at Toyota is just setting, even like setting up like the channel labels that I found like just making sure you stay organized when you're doing it so you can stay organized. <laughs> of course you like to stay organized. <laughs> of course you do. So like I said, if there's any questions, I'll go over them real quick about the uh, Pico scope software, at least the basics. I'm not the math channels. I, I just, honestly, I just check forms to see how to do math channels or at least the, uh, mathematical equations to do math channels because I, I can't memorize that stuff. So, yeah, I seen Brian talking about math channels over there, and Brian's the guy to ask. Brian, Mario, they they like to use math channels a lot. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, Chad Chad just mentioned triggers, so I want to see. I was having trouble with the demo software um, actually running triggers. So if you want to run a, a single waveform and you want to hold it steady on your screen, uh, you can come down here to your trigger setting down here at the bottom and turn it on to repeat. Just drag this little yellow uh, diamond around. And it will hold your, um, it will hold your waveform, but for whatever reason, the demo software kind of, it's working a little bit right now, but it's not working perfectly. But that is how you would kind of hold your waveform in the same spot. Then you can adjust your, your voltage time, your voltage around, and your, uh, div your time division around, basically. Yeah, normally I just, uh, personally, I just use a long time base because I feel like sometimes if you're looking at something and the, the signal happens to cut out, then it, it won't like refresh on the screen. So I just like having a long 
time base and just kind of scroll back through it and look around. You know, I do too. A lot of times I like to just use a long time base. Actually, that's how I do probably 90% of the scope work that I do. The only time I do, I like to use a trigger is on like intermittent, uh, maybe say a misfire on an ignition coil. And every once in a while, you know, you might see the shorted coil pop up that you would have to actually search for if you had a long time base. Um, so yeah, that, that's about the only time I, I really use a trigger myself. 99% of the time, I'm just using long time bases and, and zooming in. Toyota software is so, so reliable and, and so good that it's pretty forgiving. You, you don't need to, you know, there are people who know exactly which time division and which voltage voltage scale to use for each sensor. And I, and I just, I don't, but I really don't need to with the PicoScope software. Yeah. You know what makes it really, really easy for, new, that, for new users? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. So one, one thing that makes it really easy for new users is using the, using the presets that are in there. So I've never used the presets. Honestly, I, I just jumped into here and started moving things around. So when you say the preset, you're talking about up here in the automotive mm -hmm. um, menu, and you can drop down and pull up something like a Hall Effect camshaft sensor. Mm -hmm. Now that loads a preset for you. Yep. All you got to do is hook it up the way that it tells you to hook it up and press the press play and you can start recording. Yeah, honestly, I, I didn't know that. I've just jumped in, moved you know, moved all my settings around and uh, kind of went from there. But it, but it's good to know, honestly. Yeah, it, it takes all the guesswork out of all the settings, especially for a newer user. So, I mean, it, it really makes it more, <clears throat> more user-friendly, you know? It, yeah. I, I, think, I think one of the biggest things that people are afraid of with using PicoScope is just, you know, the, the setup time for it when really it's, it doesn't take that long to set it up. Yeah. I see. So this, this setup for this Hall effect sensor for me, for the most part, that's too big for most things that I'm doing. If I'm looking at a cam sensor for the most part, I, I also have a crank sensor on the screen. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I would personally uh, raise this voltage scale to 20 volts so that it would shrink the cam sensor waveform. Make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what I would do, me personally. So yeah, I don't use the, the presets, but if you're new to this and, and you don't know what voltage scale you should be on or which time division you should be on, it's definitely uh, can come in handy for sure. Mm -hmm. You could always go back use the preset and then adjust it to what you're doing as well though. You know, yeah. It gets you in the ballpark and then you fine tune it. Yeah. Now I know, um, I think it's Mario says that he, uh, he saves his own like personal settings where he has all of his voltage divisions and our voltage scale and time division set up. So as soon as he opens Pico scope, they're all ready to go. Yeah. I have, um, I have a couple different, I don't think I have them on this computer, but like if I'm doing like a relative compression test or, you know, something kind of generalized, I have certain files that I'll just open up and they're already set up generally. So I can just kind of toy with that instead of having to adjust time base, adjust, you know, sample rate. It's already set up. Yeah. Even using like old, like you said, like ones that you've done previously before, you just open it right up. And it's already set up, so you just have to go in and plug and play. Yeah, but yeah, what even even with this setup here, you know, the, this preset, I, I seen Han, Hans mention it. I always want to say Hans, and, and Hans probably gets it all the time. And I know it's Hans. Um, but yeah, he said that the sample rate is too slow, which I agree with. You know, you would want to raise the sample rate uh for this cam sensor as well, in my opinion. But it will get you in the ballpark of what you need to see. Yeah, because even in the repair manual and on TIS, it's kind of similar to that. 
Yeah, yeah. I remember I remember I when I first started. The things, they give you kind of a slow, slow sample rate, smaller window. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember seeing those waveforms in TIS under um terminals of ECU. Terminals at ECU. And I used to always set up my waveforms based on those when I first got started. That's Which such was... a valuable section. Terminals it really ECU. is. It is. Yeah. Right after I pull up a wiring diagram, nine times out of 10, I'm going right to terminals of ECU. In all data has terminals of ECU. If you type in terminals of ECU in all data, you'll get the same information that we get in TIS, which is nice. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I tried it. I tried it uh, a few weeks ago just to see. And you get the same information with all the terminal pinouts and the uh, waveforms. Tells you whether it's key on, key off, or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't know. Uh, I don't recall looking at like immobilizer waveforms in TIS, though. Has anyone looked at their known goods for their immobilizer systems? For IMI? Yeah, for IMI and IMO. I think on some cars there is, but like I haven't really, I don't think I've really looked into it that much. I know they'll do it with like video signals for like a camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember seeing the video signals for cameras for the first time. And I had no clue what to make of it, honestly. It wasn't until I took a class at Vision where, where they actually explained what was what the waveform was actually doing for a, a camera. So, but yeah, I, I really didn't see any questions about the PicoScope software. I was expecting more Toyota guys to be here, but it seems like it's the usual guys, which doesn't really surprise me. So you guys want to jump into the uh, the case studies? Yeah, let's do it. Sure. No. All right. New share. So uh, we have case studies from Nolan, Daryl, Jonathan, and uh, Gara, if he pops in. I'm not sure if he ever popped in. I'm in here. Oh, did you? And I think Tim came in clutch last minute with a case study as well. <laughs> so, guess hey, what PJ, you your right control there? panel is blocking the whole right side of the screen on YouTube. What's up? Your control panel is blocking the right side of the PowerPoint on YouTube. Oh, crap. I didn't know that it no, did. at the bottom. There you go. Boom. Oh. Is it gone? It's, uh, it's much more minimal. All right. Sounds good. All right. So uh, James, who actually ended up being the reason that this live stream exists, James sent me some waveforms when he first started using a scope about using AM clamps to diagnose uh, misfires. Uh, this was one of the first tests he did with a scope. And I just wanted to add some of the basic scope tests you can do and how beneficial they are. Because we're here, we're talking to a lot of technicians and I'm hoping that there's a lot of Toyota technicians here because that's, you know, that was the point of this. <laughs> but uh, a lot of them think that that using a scope isn't flat, flat rate friendly. And I kind of think the complete opposite. I use a scope because it's extremely flat rate friendly. So this was waveforms on a 2018, maybe 2019 Sienna uh, with a 2GR FKS. Now that's a 3.5 liter for you non Toyota guys. And it had a cylinder one misfire, which is under the intake, which is under the windshield cow now Maybe somebody with smaller arms can get in and swap the ignition coils around, but I could not, you know, I can't get my arm back there. So I explained to James to just pull out the injection injector fuse 
Uh, that fuse controls the ignition coil. It sends power to the ignition coil and the fuel injectors. Uh, it's this fuse right here. Now, truth be told, most of the time when I am using an amp clamp to diagnose these circuits, I actually go to this connector right here. I hope you all can see that. Um, it is the one directly after the fuse. And why do I use that connector? It's because most Toyotas have a connector in the fuse box. And inside the fuse box, there's a wire that comes out of the connector that goes uh, to the ignition coils and to the injectors. And instead of pulling the fuse out, uh, putting a fuse loop in and putting your amp clamp to that, I usually just grab my amp clamp and put it directly on that wire that's on that connector. And it's usually pretty easily accessible. So this here is the waveform that James got. So because of his setup, he was able to see all six ignition coils and all six fuel injectors firing on this car. Uh, so he needed to determine which one was cylinder one. So here on the blue trace, that's his current clamp uh, from his amp clamp in his fuse box. And you can see uh, ignition current clamp here, 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 and so on and so forth. In these smaller ones, these are your fuel injectors. Now, an ignition coil draws, uh, say, 10 to 12 amps of current, some a little more, some a little less. And your port injectors are usually pulling right around one amp of current. For the most part, I, I haven't really seen um, any normal port injectors pulling significantly more or less, but I'm sure there's somebody out there who has. But regardless, he needed to see uh, which one was cylinder one. So he put the ignition sink um, on cylinder two. Now, cylinder two is on the front of the engine, easy to get to. An IGT circuit is the signal circuit from the ECM to the ignition coil that tells the ignition coil to fire. So he was able to use the firing order, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, and determine that this coil... Oh, got this pointer. I didn't know I had this pointer. Look at that. I'm learning too. So he was able to find that this coil was shorted out, which was our cylinder one ignition coil uh, without removing the intake, without removing the hood cow and all of that jazz. Now this, I got this way for myself. This was on an older forerunner. <coughs> had a misfire for cylinder six. And that fuel injector was also under the intake. Um, now this waveform I got, the connector that I put an amp clamp on here was behind the glove box. So right behind the glove box, there's a, a bundle of connectors and I usually grab my ignition coil and fuel injector uh, power feeds right from that connector. And you can see here, that my fuel injector is missing. Now, anytime you're looking for a failed fuel injector, just make sure the ECM isn't purposely shutting off the uh, that circuit just to save the catalytic converter. I've been burned by that myself when I first started this. Like, oh man, I, I have a bad fuel injector when in reality, it was just the ECM protecting the catalytic converter. So definitely keep that in mind. You have, you have a cat over temp pit as well on TechStream. On on the newer cars, yeah. yeah, yeah. Now this was this was a 2002 Forerunner. I don't believe that the um, there's a cat over temp pit on this one, but there is definitely on, on newer cars for sure. And yeah, Brian. Brian was talking about his trick. Uh, I don't want to share his trick because that's his trick. Brian will scope just the battery positive circuit at a coil. And he will be looking at voltage drop instead of amperage rising, which is an amazing trick. I, I love that trick. Uh, but I'm saving that one for Brian this year because that one's all his. I'm not stealing that one. Although I use it all the time at work. I'm not, 
not stealing it for you too. <laughs> that, that's a train by text trick right there. <laughs> so Nolan, uh, you want to take over? Yeah, sure. Looks like I'm up. Oops. All right. Well, PJ, thank you for that. Uh, just kind of want to segue into, it's, it's actually a perfect segue into my case study here. So what we have here is a, it's a 2010 Toyota Prius. It's a towing, no start. And I can guarantee you that it is not a head gasket. Yeah. Not a head gasket. Not this time. Um, it's also not an inverter IPM. Um, I will tell you that it was a bad fuel pump. Um, it was actually an intermittent issue. Um, I don't think I would have been able to diagnose this thing without a without the Pico scope, to be honest. Um, and I bet you a lot of the you know a lot of Toyota technicians out there can relate to this one because you're all you're all replacing fuel pumps out there, right? Show of hands of who's who's been replacing fuel pumps. <laughs> not me anymore. All day, every day. Yeah, not me no more though. So basically what I wanted to show you is this, uh, you know, this quick test that I did. Um, basically, it's current ramping the fuel pump, you know, checking the current of it. And it's, I mean, it was such a simple test and such a quick test that I think it should be in every technician's arsenal, really. So, you know, with this car, the first thing I did, obviously, is I, you know, went to go verify the concern. Plugged in tech stream, pulled the health check, got these codes here. Got a P3190, P0A0F. So any of us that have been working in the dealerships for a while, we might have, you know, we've probably seen these codes before on a, on a Prius. In fact, there's a TSB for this thing, for these codes. Uh, it's TSB 0041-15. Uh, the repair outlined under this TSB would be to replace the EVAP purge VSV and to reprogram the ECM or the engine control module. I can guarantee you that this would have not fixed this car. And why is that is because I pulled some uh, free spring data off this thing and it just didn't line up with, you know, the, the stuff that you'd see in the TSB. So just looking at this uh, screenshot of the free frame data real quick, kind of give you my, <clears throat> my thought process and my diagnostic process on this, on this particular vehicle. When this code set, um, this car was going 38 miles an hour. Um, Engine speed was off of idle. So it's, I mean, it's definitely not a vacuum leak. And with that TSB, typically what happens is the, uh, one of the vacuum lines will pop off of the purge VSV causing a vacuum leak. Um, some of the things, what else stands out here? Uh, looking at the fuel trims, these fuel trims are pretty high. I mean, when you add them up together, 20 and, and 12, you know, you get 32. That's, those are high positive numbers. And that's usually indicative of, you know, car that's, car that's running lean. Other things to look at too would be, you know, your air fuel ratio sensor voltage or AFS voltage on bank one sensor one. That thing, that thing is peg lean, isn't it? Full lean. Yeah, super lean. It's not going to get any leaner than that. Um, so there's really only a couple things that are, that's going to cause that really. I mean, it's, it's either not going to have, it's, it's going to be out of gas or you have a fuel system issue. And I mean, looking at the fuel level uh, data list parameter, you can see it's it's not empty. That thing has gas in it. So um, after this, I uh, I cleared the codes and I was able to drive the car into the shop, which is kind of crazy to me. But you know, thinking of uh, that it was a fuel fuel delivery issue, I, I put a fuel gauge on this thing, and this thing was within spec. I mean, it's whatever the specification was. It's got it was probably around forty or fifty psi or something like that. I don't know off the top of my head, but it's within specification. In fact, I can let this thing run in my stall all day long and it'd be fine. It wouldn't act up. So that's, you know, that's when I thought to use, maybe, maybe that's an intermittent issue. Maybe it's an inter intermittent issue with the fuel pump. So the cool thing about uh, using the Pico scope is that, well, for dealer, Toyota dealer technician, Toyota and Lexus dealer technicians is 
they have this available in every every single dealership and there is training available for it as well um, but we'll get into that a little bit, a little bit later but as far as uh, hooking this thing up it's you know for those dealership technicians out there don't don't be scared of how long or how long it's going to take to hook it up it really doesn't take that long to hook it up um you know bj talked a little bit earlier about uh the, the presets and i know you know some of you guys don't like the presets but i think for a first time user they're they're great it gets you in the ballpark you know it gets you setting that thing up super quick and you'll you'll get a waveform it and it even you know with the presets it shows you how to hook it up so it basically holds your hand and walks you right through all the steps to get a waveform and it gives you an example waveform too so where you would find the presets um we showed we showed that a little bit earlier but you find it under the automotive Right there up automotive act. And then for the fuel pump, you'll go under actuators and then the fuel pump, but you can see there's a bunch of other presets there too, for whatever you want to check out. So click on those and you usually get something like this. So basically it shows you how to set it up with what tool you're going to use and an example waveform. So that example waveform that you have right there is a known good. Unfortunately in the, you know, Toyota PicoScope uh, known good library, there isn't a known good for a fuel pump, but this is pretty typical of what a known good fuel pump waveform is going to look like. Uh, don't really need to understand the, the details of it. Just just know that you got you have even peaks and valleys, and it looks you know based off of that looks pretty healthy. So yeah, when you uh, when you go through the presets or when you use that um, when you use that preset, it it sets everything up for you. I mean, you can tweak it to however however you want to tweak it, but you know, for a first time user, this thing is great. And all you really have to do is hook it up to the car. And uh, on the bottom left hand corner, you'll see, you'll see that it says stop. But if you just hit that, the play button or you, you hit space bar, you'll start getting your waveform right off of that. So for uh, Toyota techs that have uh, access to TIS or Toyota information system, you have something or Toyota uses the EWD or electronic wiring diagram, which is phenomenal because there's so many features of this thing that I'm just now learning. That's, I, I couldn't believe that I didn't know this before, but basically on the wiring diagram here, you know, on the bottom here, you have the fuel, <clears throat> fuel center gauge assembly or the fuel pump itself uh, and a connector up there. What I didn't, what I just learned is that if you click on this wire, it'll give you a, uh, you know, the connector views of both, both components connected to that, to both ends of that wire. Plus it'll give you the pin location in that connector. So unfortunately I didn't get a picture of that. Uh, and I'll just take you to where that's, well, actually on this car, I ended up going to connector AR1, which was very convenient, conveniently located in the left kick panel as indicated by that arrow right there. And this picture kind of shows basically my setup. I mean, accessing that point was even quicker than pulling the rear seat and getting to the connector for the fuel pump. I mean, not even five minutes there. For, for those of us have, who've been working in dealers for a while or on cars for a while, I mean, that it just snaps in. You, you just pull that panel out and it's right there and you hook up right to that wire using the, uh, the inductive. Yeah. And there's probably a bunch of junk in the seat if it's a Prius in the rear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've all, we've all been there. We've all been I think, there. I think 50% of Prius owners live in their car. <laughs> <laughs> Guaranteed to be the cleanest vehicle you'll ever work on. Yeah. Yeah. We got <laughs> Isaac here and all he has is Priuses. So you got to watch what you say. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> and they're all pretty, pretty disgusting. They were all well pre-owned before they ended up here. We'll call them well used. They're well used. So on that particular car, this is the waveform that I got from that fuel pump. It looked pretty nasty based off of what I what you see here. These arrows are pointing to basically the dropouts that you're seeing. You're not you're definitely not getting even peaks and valleys on this thing. I, I mean, based off of this and what I've seen before, I mean this this is a bad mm -hmm. fuel pump for sure. And well, basically, you know, the repair for this car, replace the fuel pump. 
we're all pretty familiar with that process by now. The screen shows a good and a bad versus the bad waveform. Goods on top, bads on the bottom. I mean, you, the difference is, I mean, the, yeah, I mean, it's, it's clear as day as far as the difference there. So I'm to assume too, since that uh, on your bad waveform, waveform and it's repeating, mm -hmm. that is telling you that there's a bad segment in the commutator? Yes. Yes. And whereas if you had, say, a high resistance in the wiring somewhere, you would not, it would be affecting the whole waveform, not a repeating. So that kind of eliminates the issue of it being uh, the actual wiring itself. Well, not just that, you have to keep in mind that uh, we'll say most wiring issues, we'll say resistance, you have corrosion in a connector. What does mm -hmm. resistance do? Makes amperage go down, right? Yeah. So if you have a bad, bad wire, um, corrosion in a connector, your amperage, you're, you're not going to be pulling four amps of current through a bad wire. You're just not going to. Yeah. Uh, so, so just the fact that you're able to pull four amps through it is going to tell you that most likely, most likely your wiring is good. You know, you, you know, your ground's going to be good. If you have a bad ground, that's going to lower, lower your amperage. Uh, the only thing that's going to raise your amperage for the most part, um, it's going to be a shorted wire or a motor doing excessive amounts of work, you know? So four amps, you know, nothing shorted because, you know, you'd be pulling more amps and you know that you don't have resistance. So without, without even checking power or ground, you know, your wiring to the pump is good. Yep. That's an awesome point. Yeah, there's there's so much that you can gather just just from a simple test like this, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the cool thing is, is, you know, for Toyota dealer technicians out there, you can go to a class that will teach you all this stuff. And it's the 670, 673 class. In fact, this is a page straight out of the book from that class doing the same test, explaining everything that we just talked about right here. Yeah. And, you know, for for newer techs out there. We go over this in, in T10 as well. So we, we cover this exact same test, this exact same thought process, everything in, in T10. So that's what I got. I just Talk. took your screen sharing off. Yeah, I actually, I have a fuel pump here. I don't know if you all can see it. Uh, I work with a guy who works at a machinist shop who cut a, he cut two fuel pumps open for me. He cut the, actually, let me get rid of this screen. Maybe it will make me a little bit bigger. Um, so he cut open a three-phase fuel pump right here. You see the windings on the outside. Uh, in the magnet on the inside, and I just dropped, just dropped my other one. So that fuel pump that you had, you have your commutator bars that were most likely worn, or your brushes were worn. And when these, how these motors work is you have power going in through your commutators, through your windings, creates a magnetic field that opposes or attracts to magnets that are sitting on the outside. Um, so when those waveforms, when you see crappy waveforms, most likely it is your commutators or your brushes wearing out. So, but yeah, I, I'm doing this world pack class. So I had him cut open a three phase fuel pump because I've never seen inside of one. Uh, so that's pretty cool in my opinion. <laughs> All right, Tim, you're up next. You ready? Yeah, all right. Let me uh, – can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. All right, cool. Did that pop up for you? Yep. All right. All right, the case I got for you is going to be like how to check – it came in cranked timing uh, on the oscilloscope. So the car that I had here came in as a 2005 4Runner. It was the V8. 
And the customer's concern was, uh, it was a noticeable reduction in horsepower. The check engine light was on. And it had kind of an, an off idle. So the codes I had in there, it had a correlation code for the camshaft on both banks. So bank one and bank two. I could clear these codes and immediately they would come back within five seconds, 10 seconds. I'm not sure exactly, but they would come back almost instantly. And I had uh, met a random misfire on pretty much every cylinder at idle. Like as you revved it up, it would get a little better. But uh, at idle, it would sit there and just pop a little bit. And so this is obviously going to be a, a cam timing issue based off the codes and the symptoms. So option one I mean, is the old school where you can go ahead and pull the timer covers off, get your crank lined up on top dead center, and physically inspect these marks. And uh, this engine's not so bad, but I know you can obviously imagine if this was a, the V6 that had a, 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 um, a timing chain, you'd be pulling the valve covers. You would uh, you have the intake pulled off. It's a pretty big job, but on this one, I feel like it'd be at least an hour to get both those top covers off. The coolant price to come out because that thermostat housing's in the way. It's a pretty big job. So the alternative is to pull the glove box out. It's really all you've got to do. Like they are talking before, these things really aren't that difficult to hook up to the car. So in this car, this ECM access is pretty good. And since it's inside of the car, it doesn't have like the grommets on the back of the wire. So they're pretty easy to back probe as well. And to capture these waveforms only took 10 to 20 minutes max. They're pretty, they're pretty easy to do, pretty time efficient. So this is how we hooked it up. I, I have a, a four channel scope. I only had to use three channels on this guy so I could put all of them in the same capture. So I've got a, a lead going to the positive NE for the, the crankshaft sensor and both positive sides of these camp sensors. And uh, that's pretty much it. These test leads have a, have a, have like a positive and a negative lead. The negatives would all go to a, a ground, body ground anywhere. And so after we do about, well, your waveform is only as good as a, that's what you compare it to. So uh, sometimes one of those time consuming parts is to find a known good. And there's a lot, of, a lot of resources for you. The TMS software has a bunch of known goods. Uh, Kiko has a bunch of known goods. There's a couple of Facebook groups. There's, there's a lot of places to go find a known good. So I'm gonna come off this program to show you. A known good that I used was off of a Lexus GX. Let me move this menu up a little bit here. All right, so the, the curse, some of the cursors he was talking about earlier. Let me zoom in here on this. So I've got two of these sections. Let me clean this up a little bit for you. Get these guys out of the way. This is the blue trace is obviously the crankshaft sensor here, and there's other two with the camshaft one. So each one of these sections here is going to be a 360 degrees rotation of the crankshaft. And obviously, if I, for all um, six or all eight cylinders to have a com complete cycle, it's going to take two revolutions. So I'm going to pull this cursor over here. I'm going to set the end of this. I don't want to measure. I'm going to use the first heightened peak right here of this uh, cycle it's going through. Then I'm going to pull this guy back here to the first one of that one. So that's going to be two complete revolutions of the crankshaft. So after I pull these cam signals back down over this thing, we'll take some, some measurements. I'm going to pull both these guys down here in this little, this white where here is gonna allow you to make measurements off of those uh, signals. So I'm gonna set this guy just the first peak here, and I'm gonna set this other guy right here on this first peak of the, of the trace. So up here in this box here, so you guys can see that, I've got approximately the height of my first peak here is 170 degrees roughly from my first, first measurement. My second one is approximately 260 degrees of crankshaft rotation after that. So, so now I can use those. I can compare that to the waveform that I have because this is the known good. And we can see if this is off at all. So on that over here, this is a lot bigger capture, but we can do the same thing. Let's clean that up. Gonna get these. Oh, hold on to that one. The colors are a little different on these guys. I had these hooked to different ch channels than my known good was. 
So I'm going to do the same thing with these cursors. I'm going to pull up to my first line of that series, the first line of that one. If I match that other guy, I'm going to add a, another line there. Be this, this one actually, it's, it's going to come off of. I need to scroll over because I got into a different waveform here. So, the same as the first one we did. But you can obviously see my measurements are off a little bit here. I got 140 degrees here and approximately 230 on the next one. So we're going to go ahead and go back to this slideshow and compare those two. So this was my, my good way form. Remember that was 170 and 260. And to go down to my suspect, was 140 so i've got about 30 degrees of difference here so obviously my cam timing is off and if you go back to here you you can actually count how many teeth it is off of the the crank sensor trigger here you go one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen approximately 17 teeth there the next guy here was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So we have approximately three of these teeth off. So uh, that's evidence enough for us to pull this thing down or tell the customer that the common covers need to be pulled off and uh, it needs to have either like, engine timed again or a new belt depending on their, I guess their service history. And so, at first, the customer declined this. So this is one of the time savers is after I pulled off these common covers, I didn't have to uh, put this thing back together and only get them paid like my hour diagnosis and have the guy not fix it. But um, he ended up calling us back a couple hours later, had us do it, and that's exactly what we found. He had had this belt done by somebody else. You see, I got my crank here on zero, and the guy who did the belt had timed it to these service marks instead of the top dead center marks right here. So that was this case study that I had here. And it's just like, just, just imagine this was on a different car. This was on a, a 5.7 Tundra or a 2GR on a, and really anything, but especially a front wheel drive car, this would not be so easy to get access to these things. It could be a serious operation to pull in the valve covers or pulling time covers off stuff. So this is a real time saver if you can understand how this stuff works. It's just another tool to keep in your, in your toolbox. <clears throat> is there anything else I should add into that? I just want to say that I miss that 4.7 liter gravy. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't miss it one bit. So, so for those of you that don't know, uh, when I first met Nolan, it seemed like the only scope captures I ever seen from him were for head gaskets and fuel pumps. That's all this guy does for a living. That's all he did was head gaskets and fuel pumps. They came in threes. Yeah. <laughs> I might have done three head gaskets in, in, in my 12-year career. He did three in a month. <laughs> Never again. <laughs> Never again. Let me do them. <laughs> you can have them. I don't want them. Oh, in the uh, the only Tundra head gasket I did was on a lifted Tundra, and I'm only five foot eight. Like, oh, like I struggle yeah. working on Tundras oh, anyhow. Yeah. <laughs> so put a four inch lift on it. I'm struggling. <laughs> What's the saying? Pull the cab. That's yeah. Daryl saying. I did pull the cab. I did. I'll probably get crap for it, but I did pull the cab. I live in the Rust Belt. Pulling the cab isn't isn't a big deal to me. We do so many uh, so many fuel uh, fuel pumps. We do so many frame replacements that pulling a cab is no big deal. 
All right, so this is my case study. And th this case study, I, I kind of hold near and dear to my heart. It was, it was one of the first times I, I used a scope to diagnose a car. It probably could not have been fixed without a scope. Uh, now, it, it's kind of an older case study, and some of you all may have seen it floating around because I, I posted it on Facebook in a lot of the groups before I had a YouTube channel. Uh, but yeah, th this car, this car was a, was a fun one. So vehicle history of this car, it had a five SE FE engine and, uh, the vehicle was at an independent shop for close to a year. Uh, this, the owner of this shop, it was a very small shop. He was an older gentleman, didn't really have the tooling, uh, to diagnose cars, but he really didn't need to. It wasn't his specialty. He, he kind of just did brakes, tires, stuff like that. But this car came to him for a timing belt. So it was supposed to be a pretty simple timing belt for him. Uh, now, when it was all said and done, the owner of the shop actually bought this car back because he had so much labor and parts invested in it. But he came into my shop once and he asked for... Uh, he... He asked me to help him. So I said, hey, do you have a scope? Maybe check this. And he said, yeah, he, he had a scope. But really what he had was the original uh, Snap-on uh, Vantage. I think it was a Vantage. It was a pretty sure it was called a Vantage, the original Snap-on Oscilloscope. But uh, that scope just it, it didn't do what it, what it needed uh, to do for him. So what all, what all did this guy replace? So it came in for a timing belt. Once he was done with the timing belt, it no longer started. So he obviously, he checked timing. He, for some reason, put a head gasket on it. I don't know if he thought that he had it timed wrong, maybe bent belt. I don't know. I just know he originally put a timing belt on it. Then he put a head gasket on it. After the head gasket, he did two cam sensors, two crank sensors. He overlaid the wiring from the ECM cam and crank sensors. Uh, he put in both ignition coils twice uh he what he overlaid wires from the ecm to the ignition coils he put four fuel injectors in this both upstream and downstream oxygen sensors a map sensor spark plugs and wires not one not two but yes three uh used ecms he put in this plus there were a couple other things i kind of lost track after that So where did I start? Uh, obviously, this thing didn't start. I wanted to check uh, Spark, and I, I went. I, I went going. I knew going into this that I, I wasn't going to have Spark. He told me that was his issue. Um, so I grabbed the test light to check Spark, like I generally do. And uh, when you were cranking this over, I got one Spark event from cylinder one. You can see IGT. Uh, to the cylinder one ignition coil, well, uh, to the one ignition coil, uh, I got one spark event while cranking it. After it sparked one time, it would not uh, spark again, which is obviously what was causing his no, spark, no start. So I wanted to make sure he was getting his powers and grounds to his ignition coils, obviously. Um, I wanted to make sure that his powers and grounds to his ECM were good. And I definitely wanted to check his inputs and outputs. Now, when I when I first started getting into this whole advanced diagnostics, I always seen Jim Morton talking about garbage in, garbage out. So I scoped his cam and crank sensors, and this is the waveform that I got. Now, keep in mind, this is when I was first getting started down this path. And I knew that his crank sensor waveform didn't look right, Uh but I didn't know why at the time, you know, so I posted this waveform on a Facebook page and I asked if anybody had a known good because that crank sync just didn't look right to me. Now, me nowadays, if I seen this, I would, I would know the issue. Uh, but at the time I, I didn't, I, I needed something to compare it to in a, a guy sent me one and he kind of handed it hinted like, Hey, I'm pretty sure you have a broken tooth, which, I was fairly certain I did, but I didn't have the experience at the time to make the call. Um, 
So you can see here the known good. It literally just goes, uh, the crank sink just, just rises. We'll go back to the last one. You actually see it go up, then back down and up again. So this was my waveform that I got after the vehicle was fixed. You can see that he had a broken tooth on his crank reluctor. Now, without a, without a scope, uh, you could have fixed this if you used luck. And maybe a little bit of common sense. Like I knew that the car uh, didn't start after you put a timing belt on it. So, so I was pretty certain that that was going to be his issue. Somewhere in there was going to be his issue. Uh, but it was cool to use a scope to diagnose this. But you put that crank reluctor on and it didn't fix the car. And I felt bad. I felt terrible for the guy because I was fairly certain that this was going to fix his car. So the car would now start, but it wouldn't idle anymore. Um, so I went back out to diagnose this car with them. And you can get this thing to run it if you gave it a little bit of gas, kept it at like 1500 RPM. But it, if you let off that throttle at all, it was dying. So I grabbed some scan data and I, I look, I noticed the map sensor data PID was reading atmospheric pressure at idle now it wasn't really really idling this car was running like crap uh but i knew that my map sensor should have been reading uh lower than it was at the time so i verified my engine vacuum with a vacuum gauge and i seen that my needle was bouncing on my vacuum gauge so i grabbed my scope again and i grabbed a relative compression waveform now i know I know we didn't talk about some of the, the tests. Again, this is directed to the Toyota guys, but you can check engine compression with a scope on a, well, with an amp clamp on a battery. If you just put this on your battery cable while you're cranking your engine, uh, you're going to get these peaks and valleys. Now, every time your piston's coming up on the compression stroke, it's causing your starter to work harder and you're going to have more amperage draw from your battery. And you're actually able to scope this. Uh, you're actually able to view these compression events on a scope. So if you have a cylinder with low compression, the starter doesn't have to work as hard to overcome that compression. And you will see a dropout in your waveform. Now, this waveform didn't have any dropouts. Uh, so I knew that it wasn't a single cylinder or maybe two cylinders causing this, but I still wanted to do a relative compression test just to see uh, what was going on because I had the bouncing needle on my vacuum gauge. Then I went in cylinder. Now this here is a, a generic in cylinder waveform. Um, I, I guess if you've never seen these waveforms before, this here is the peak. Oh, let me get my cursor back up. This here is the peak of your compression stroke, uh, relatively speaking. So this here is going to be your expansion stroke. This is gonna be your exhaust stroke, your intake stroke and your compression stroke again. Now, the key takeaway with this is right about here, I might not have this marked right. I, I have a menu for Zoom in my way to actually mark this out where I need to mark it. But in this area is where you see my exhaust valve actually open up, crap. The menu went away, then it popped back up as soon as I used a mouse. But what you will see is you will see pressure starting to rise, even though my piston is going down on the expansion stroke. Now, I learned this from Brandon Steckler, who was uh, pretty monumental in my career. Brandon Steckler is a good friend of mine, and I highly advise everybody to take his class. Everybody. Everybody should. Even if you're not a scope user, honest to God, you should take his class because it will change your career. But... With that being said, uh, what you will see is pressure start to rise when your exhaust valve opens, even though the piston is going down. So where, where your pressure starts to rise is where your exhaust valve opens, which is uh, right in this area. Now, I have this marked out every 180 degrees of crank rotation, um, but these small lines are every 30 degrees. So this here is about 45 degrees uh, before bottom dead center, your exhaust valve 
is supposed to open uh, for most makes and models. Um, also keep in mind that where your compression stroke is, where you, where you see pressure start to rise is where your intake valve closes. Now, keep in mind during your compression stroke, uh, your piston is traveling upwards, but you notice that there's about 60 degrees of crank angle where you're not building pressure. That is because your intake valve is still open. Uh, so when your intake valve close, closes is when you start to build compression, which is right around 60 degrees mark. Now, keep that in mind. Uh, exhaust valve is going to open at 45 degrees before bottom dead center. And your intake valve is going to close about 60 degrees uh, after bottom dead center. So I got this waveform. Now this waveform looks like crap. Uh, this, like I said, this was years ago when I made my own pressure transducer. I, I built a five volt regulator box and I used a crappy transducer and it stunk, but I was able to get the job done with it. So I have this marked out. Uh, you see this little flag. This is where my exhaust valve opening is supposed to take place. But keep in mind that I said that when the pressure rises is when the exhaust valve actually closes. So if this is about 30 degrees, 60, 90, I'm about 90 de degrees retarded on my exhaust valve timing. Um, anytime you're using a scope, your scope is obviously voltage over time. So anything to the right of where it should be is retarded. Anything to the left is advanced. Um, so I knew that my exhaust valve opening was 90 degrees retarded, but my intake valve closing is pretty close to where it should be. So I knew it wasn't a timing belt issue. And I knew that it was specifically his exhaust valve, an exhaust valve timing issue. So I had him pull the valve cover off, which is pretty simple. It's just four uh, 30 millimeter nuts if you've ever taken this engine apart. And I know that this picture sucks, but it's the best I can find. Uh, basically on the intake cam, there's two gears, uh, two dots. And on the exhaust cam, there's two dots. And as the cams rotate, the dots are supposed to line up, right? But he had them lined up like this. <laughs> I guess that's the best ex explanation that I have. And it caused his exhaust valve timing to be 90 degrees off. Uh, I just pulled his exhaust valve or his exhaust cam out, uh, put it back in the place where it should be. And this thing ran, ran. So that is the first case study I wrote. And the first time I used in cylinder transducers to diagnose a car. So this case study, even though it's a little old, it's definitely uh, one of my most favorite. Was that in cylinder done cranking or running? This was done. That's a tough question. It was done barely running. How about okay. it was done barely running? It wasn't, it was probably, um, probably around 900 RPM, but it was barely running. Like if I let off the gas at all, it, it was dying. All right, so uh, we went over some of the in-cylinder testing things and I explained the expansion stroke, the exhaust stroke, the intake stroke and compression stroke um, already. And this here is the waveform. So this here is a retarded exhaust valve. Daryl is drawing on my screen. <laughs> I didn't know it did that. <laughs> what are you drawing? I have no clue. <laughs> So, so yeah, this, this one obviously is retarded exhaust valve timing. Now this one is advanced and Daryl still is drawn on my screen. <laughs> I can't erase it. It won't let me erase ah, it. And now we got Nolan popping up hearts. This is, this is amazing. So. <laughs> that's great. That's great. I don't even know how you guys are doing that. Either. So one of the things you'll notice with an advanced uh, exhaust valve timing is this big hump at the end of your exhaust stroke. Now that is because your piston is still moving upwards, 
valve is uh, closing early. Uh, so this one, like I said, generally speaking, generally speaking, uh, most exhaust valve openings happen around 45 degrees before bottom dead center. There's definitely some, some engines uh, that are a little bit before and a little bit after, but right around there is generally where you're going to see most Toyotas. Uh, this one was about 60 degrees before bottom dead center. Um, so yeah, this here was about 15, is my math right? 15 degrees uh, advanced, right? Yeah, 15 degrees advanced, causing this hump. Uh, this waveform actually came from a V6 engine. And I, I guess I, I wanted to talk about this. So you're when you're scoping these, these engines over and you're talking about uh, valve timing, you got to keep in mind that variable valve timing plays a role. And you got to keep in mind how cars work. So your exhaust valve timing generally with variable valve timing is going to um, retard your exhaust valve timing for your exhaust and advance your intake. Um, so for so to have an advanced exhaust valve timing, I knew it wasn't a variable valve timing issue, right? You can only go you can only go so so advanced uh, with your exhaust valve timing basically what I'm trying to get to is there's no way for this to be a valve, a variable valve timing issue. So I pulled the valve cover off of this and I actually seen that somebody had stuck a oil funnel into the oil fill cap and bent a, um, what's that called? Someone help baffle. me out. I'm, I'm losing my train. The oil. baffle. There we go. The baffle. They bent the baffle down into the timing chain. And that caused the uh, timing chain to jump on the exhaust cam. Let me guess, a 1GR? A 2GR. 2GR. Okay. It was like a 0708 Avalon. Okay. So I have one here for a 2011 Acura TL with a cylinder one misfire. So remember, we were talking about uh, doing the relative compression test where we hook up, hook up our amp clamp right to the battery and we're checking our compression of the engine without pulling a single coil, without pulling a single spark plug. So for those Toyota techs who say a scope is not fast, you're crazy. I can do a relative compression test in minutes, even on the back of an engine that I can't get to, the cylinders on. Uh, actually this Acura cylinder one is on the back of the engine, but. Mm. The reality of it is Acura engines, you can get to the back bank pretty easily. But with that being said, uh, you can see I have one, two, three, four, five compression peaks. And then I have one missing. So I had no compression in cylinder one. Uh, when I took this waveform, I only had a two channel scope, so I didn't have a sink. Uh, but my red trace is for a uh, transducer so here's Cody, because Cody's the man, and I'll, I'll give him a shout out. I was using a pulse sensor from Cody in the exhaust. And you can see that every time I was losing compression or, or I had a cylinder that did not have compression, uh, I had a spike in my exhaust, inferring that uh, my loss of compression was due to an exhaust valve sealing issue. So I used a borescope and you're actually able to see the exhaust valve had a pretty big crack in it. And I'm pretty sure that these Honda engines are, are pretty common for this uh, issue. I, th I think you guys out there probably know more than I do about it, but I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, if you don't adjust your valves on the Hondas. Yeah, yeah. If you don't adjust your valves, it, it leaves the exhaust valve open, which burns them. That's what it was. I, I couldn't remember. I couldn't remember the exact details of it but yeah over time your exhaust valves get tight uh, which opens them early and closes them late and hangs it open during the combustion process which burns the valves all right so i wanted to go over uh, cylinder identification charts because daryl has a case study next 
and I still have, I still have my hearts and my smiley faces and everything else. So uh, we have a sink here, IGT, on my red trace. You see right here. Now this lines up, we are inferring uh, top down of our compression stroke for cylinder one. We are using this chart to see where everything else is within that waveform. So right after top dead center of our compression stroke, we have our power stroke or, or our expansion stroke for cylinder one. We also have the compression stroke taking place for cylinder three, our intake taking place for cylinder four, and our exhaust taking place for cylinder two. So I was able to use this waveform to determine which cylinder was misfiring. Now this was on a Prius and for whatever reason, the um, data pits for misfires were not working on this Prius. The, the Prius was just running so poorly. The data pits weren't working and I didn't know which cylinders were misfiring, which is why, why I use this method. So if you've ever been around old school people, they talk about uh, misfires causing vacuum in the exhaust. And that is because when no combustion takes place, you're gonna have vacuum in your combustion chamber when your exhaust valve opens. So I had, again, pulse sensor in the exhaust and you can actually see on cylinder four, when cylinder four was on the exhaust stroke, uh, I was pulling into vacuum when that exhaust valve opened. So I knew that my misfire was on cylinder four. I, I had a single cylinder misfire, even though at the time I had codes for, I think three or four, maybe three, three cylinders at the time. So I was able to just isolate which cylinder was misfiring. Now there were other ways to do it, but I like doing it this way. So it's, it's the route I went. All right, so Daryl, Daryl, you are up. Hey, real quick, PJ, you can uh, you can clear all those. Oh, it looks like you already did it. Cool. Uh, I don't. I didn't know how to clear it. <laughs> I'll show you sometime. <laughs> Sorry about that. Makes it fun though. <laughs> all right, is it my turn? It's your turn. All right, let's see here. All right, so I had a, uh, a Chevy Express 3500 come into our shop. Um, let me pull up some of the codes here. It ran really, really, really bad. Um, definitely felt like a no compression, one cylinder. Um, had a bunch of codes in it. Uh, map sensor performance, lean, some lean fuel trims. Um, bunch of other stuff um went straight i like using the pico diagnostic software um just because normally on every car i'll do a battery test with it to begin with and then i can just roll over to the i already have the amp clamp hooked up and i already have um you know my leads that are already hooked up anyway so um I went ahead and just did a clear flood mode on a Chevy. You can just push the gas pedal down and it disables fuel and you can just crank it over until the Pico tells you to stop. Um, and it was showing I had pretty much nothing on a cylinder. Um, now with the Pico diagnostics, I don't think it doesn't tell you which cylinder it is. It just tells you you're missing one. Um, so after that, let's see. Oh, <laughs> uh, after that i hooked it up um i actually went in the after i found out i had a a dead hole in it i actually went in cylinder and i also hooked up um a pulse sensor and I also went in cylinder as well. Hold on, I'm backwards here, hold on. There we go. So I actually went back into the normal uh, Pico software and I overlaid um, ignition trigger sync. And I also overlaid um, 
an intake pulse, which I took at the purge port. Um, and you can see right here, got a dead, a dead hole, um, no compression peak. And my intake pulls look really, really weird. Um, like right here and right here were really, really elevated and kind of right here as well. So, so now I went in cylinder and basically I had, I didn't have a, a different capture for this, but this was the, in, in, in the green, it was uh, my in-cylinder capture. And I had very little, almost no pressure in there, but on the intake pulse, I actually divided it up a little in, into fours. Um, and as the piston was coming down, you can see a big vacuum pull. Um, here's the zero. I usually base everything off the zero mark for the pulse sensor. But as the piston's coming up, um, you get this high, high elevated pressure in the intake manifold and one here as well. So I knew that something was kind of jacked up with on the like a valve intake valve problem or something. Um, this motor has, uh, or you got to pull the dog, the dog house on it. Um, so I pulled the dog house off before I did this and lo and behold, let's see. I had a broken valve spring. It was basically just keeping the valve. It wasn't allowing the, um, the valve to completely seat back up into the valve seat. So it was just staying open. But, uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty much it, <laughs> I guess. Um, and then I did an after um, screenshot afterwards, and I didn't do any syncs or anything, but that's basically what um, the RC test was afterwards, and that's what the intake pulse after the repair, I put a valve spring in it. Um, and everything was even, it ran great. Um, the thing with this is when we got the car, there was a bunch of parts. You could tell that there was like a couple coils put on there. There was a new throttle body, uh, a couple vacuum hoses. Um, but yeah, <laughs> that's it. Good job. All right, I forget where we are. Oh, John, John's head gasket. Oh yeah, hold up. Give me one second. Another head gasket? Another one. <laughs> yeah, I oh, actually man. legit, I was gonna use uh, Nolan's head gasket case study because I have like 60 of his, but I, but I deleted it so that John can have one. <laughs> I this have so many cool. waveforms all from Nolan for head gasket failures. That's all I do. Well, Nolan said he wanted to come out of here. I have three Gen 3s with blown head gaskets here right now for him. That's only one day's worth of work for him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Can you guys see my screen or not yet? Not no, yet. I, I don't see your screen. Okay. Nolan, do you have it down to where you do the old Dodge Neon, uh, just the, the head gasket shuffle, just lift it up, slide the head gasket right in and bolt it back down? <laughs> no, we do it the right way, every way. Oh, not a Chrysler. All right, we we yeah, drop the motor out, we do it that way. All right. I think I put share screen, so I think we're okay, right? Yep, you're good. Yep. All righty then. So mine's going to be pretty short compared to everyone else's. Um, let me see. This is a 2002 Toyota Tacoma with a 2.4 customer states vehicle is overheating. Um, first thing I did, I road tested the vehicle just to make sure it was overheating and it sure was. So I brought it back to the shop and tell the customer I need to take over it. Uh, first thing, let me see. I performed the coolant pressure test to see if there's any like, you know, external leaks. I didn't notice anything. So that's when I decided, okay, I think it's time for the Pico scope. Um, just a little reminder, um, if people don't know where to look for the IGT, 
Um, I'm pretty sure um, PJ has mentioned before, IGT is the one wire on the coil that's different from the others, so especially on Toyotas. So just a heads up when you guys see my next chart. Um, let me see. Oh, there you go. All righty. So um, I got three things that I, I, I put on the chart. It was a relative compression test. Uh, my, my ignition sink was a cylinder one. It was a four cylinder. Um, the firing order was one, three, four, two. So um, I brought out my pole sensor and I you know, put it right on the radiator neck and I disabled my fuel. Um, and what I noticed is that when I captured my waveform that every time I hit cylinder number three, which is right around here, if you can see my cursor, I saw a pressure rise. And if you were to follow, if I, if I was to go across the graph, which I don't, I just have this screenshot that I made, you would see on every, every single time that cylinder, cylinder three came up, you know, I would, you would see that pressure rise. I mean, you guys feel free to budge in it's my first time so uh, let me see so what i did right after was i went in and took the coil and the spark plug out just to verify to see if you know my head gasket was leaking and i got a video right here for you guys excuse that there's music in the background Pressurize the cooling system. Got my boroscope, and look at that. She was leaking. So I felt pretty accomplished when that happened because I didn't need to disassemble nothing to get that result. That's a nice picture you had on that on that boroscope. Oh yeah, that that was that made my day when I found that one right there because I was actually I believe if I'm not mistaken it was the first or second head gasket I had done. So that one's we, don't, we don't see those engines um, often at all up here. Everything is four wheel drive up here just because just because of the snow. We don't have that beautiful weather like you people in California do. <laughs> so I have almost no experience with that engine. Oz from Oz Mechanics just bought a truck with a similar engine. I, th I think they're so similar. And he was asking me about it. And I'm like, man, I, I know nothing about that engine. Nothing. Yeah. I, I really haven't worked on any. They're only in uh, two-wheel drive trucks, I think. Oh, yeah. they're, they're, they're sure. Well. I guess they're pretty common on these cars. Um, Is that the 2ZR? Or no, the, the, two, the, the 3RZ two, or something like that. 3RZ, yeah, yeah. That's a, the 3, yeah, 3RZ. Three yeah. I think there's a 2RZ and 3RZ, a 2.4 and a 2.7 for those years. But yeah, they're very common, and um, you know I'm glad I'm I was able to do this test and not have to take anything apart because actually the customer did actually decline. Let me go to the next slide. And I just broke my boroscope. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, I have I have an Autel boroscope in all all in one. It has the uh, screen on it. It's handheld. Not this scope that you hook up to a tablet or the scope that you hook up to a laptop, the all-in-one unit, and I love that thing. I yeah. forget, I think it's the MV480 or 408, maybe. Isaac, what, what scope is that? You sell them. You should know. <laughs> There's the 408 and the, uh, and the well, MV400 and MV500. The MV500 is like the top-of-the-line bees knees autel scope. No, no, I have the one below that, and it works really well. It has the side too, which is nice. I've yeah, got... that's going to be the Autel MV four hundred. Yeah, and and just just to go back a little bit, I know I was moving a little quick. Um, just for the guys that don't, you know, that haven't used the pole sensors, um, when you put the pole sensor in the, you know, in the radiator, make sure you don't. There's no coolant or anything that could get back into your sensor because they will damage it, and you will have to purchase one from Cody. So, you know, just, just a heads up, just an FYI, because I almost did that the first time. You all done? Uh, let me just, uh, I mean, my last 
No, oh, yeah. Not. I forgot oh, about this slide. This is my favorite slide. Oh, man. I had to show it to you guys. Um, so the customer declined. The customer declined anything, which, you know, whatever. You know, they could go get it fixed somewhere else. But I was able to get my three hours for inspection, which took about 20 minutes to find out. And um, and just in case you guys all want to, you know, if anyone wants to buy any pulse sensors, go um, hit up my buddy Cody. They're awesome. I think I got like four of them now. <laughs> <laughs> and again, you know, thanks to PJ and, you know, the rest of the guys for letting me share this case study. Again, it's my first case study, so I'm only going to get better. And again, thanks. Good Bring job. Up. You did great, man. Yeah, I just, I was talking too fast. That's my problem. But it's all good. <laughs> all right. I think I just have one more left. I think there's just one more case study left. And I think we already kind of went through something similar. So this was a 2010 RAV4 no start. Uh, again, I, I checked for a spark. I had no spark. Just to prove that I have learned since the 99 Camry, uh, I got my cam and crank sensor waveform. And I was able to determine on my own without asking for any help. So see, you can learn over time. But uh, my crank waveform is obviously pretty crap once you once you've seen a, a couple of them now i asked myself what caused that damage so i pulled out the crank sensor and used the boroscope in the crank sensor hole to look at the damage on the crank reluctor and you can see that the teeth are bent up but i still wanted to know uh, what caused the teeth to bend now hindsight 2020 i should have just stopped right there I had never had this engine apart at the time. And I didn't know that this crank sensor is pressed on to the crank or the crank reluctor is pressed onto the crank. Um, let me minimize that. So I didn't know that the reluctor was pressed onto the crank and it needed a crank or engine for that matter. Uh, anyways, uh, why did it need, need an engine? Well, I ended up taking the valve cover off and I seen the exhaust DVT cam gear uh, was actually broken. And it was just broken from lack of maintenance. You can actually see the oil in here. It's black. This car was never maintained. We ended up putting in a used engine for the customer. Um, but yeah, just wanted to show you all that I, that I did learn from the 99 Camry. And Gara, I think you're last. You ready? I'm ready. Is that how you pronounce your name? Uh, no, it's Jera. Well, that's ah, you could have corrected me two hours ago. Uh, well, it's okay. <laughs> Everybody says my name wrong all the time, so I don't really pay so, attention. So before you came on here and before we attempted to go live and utterly failed, uh, we were all going to try to pronounce your name differently just to see <laughs> which one was right, just to see when you would actually like acknowledge that we were all purposely trying to say your name differently well i almost corrected you at the beginning but i didn't want to interrupt <laughs> all righty all right can you guys see that okay yep all righty so i had a 2007 Highlander from hell. Um, it was a crank no start. Uh, another tech was dispatched to the ticket. He quickly realized he was in over his head. Um, we had a engine immobilizer issue. Uh, no communication was available with the immobilizer ECU through uh, tech stream. Uh, security light was always flashing. Um, I started by checking powers and grounds. Everything seemed good, you know, load checked, voltage dropped. I thought, easy, needs an ECU, no communication. Um, I decided to get the Pico scope out. And I hooked uh, the IMO and IMI signals at the ECU, uh, engine ECU, and um, I had no communication. I had 12 volts um, on IMO and zero volts on IMI little hump showing that the key was turned on, but it was immediately pulled almost all the way back to ground. Um, 
this is a known good from a uh, was that pre-call worksheet for talking to Toyota technical assistance. Um, so it looks nothing, nothing like the other one. Um, PJ, you asked me to share this. I'm going to let you kind of fill in. I kind of get lost a little bit on this part. All right. So basically um, how this circuit works is the ECM is supplying 12 volts through a resistor on IMO. All right. So anything you may measure outside of the ECM is going to be on the ground side of the circuit. So actually I have this backwards. The ID code box is sending 12 volts through a resistor. So anything outside of the ID code box is going to be on the ground side of the circuit. So let's just say hypothetically you have a, a light bulb, a simple light bulb circuit. You have 12 volts going to it. When your ground path is closed on your light bulb, you should have zero volts on your ground wire, right? So how this computer talks, how the ECM talks to the ID code box is the ECM is going to ground that signal. Now that's going to take your 12 volts coming out of your ID code box and drop it down to zero volts. Likewise, um, the ECM is going to supply 12 volts through a resistor out to the ID code box through circuit IMI. So that's essentially a mobilizer in, a mobilizer out. Um, so you have this 12 volts being fed through a resistor to the ID code box. When the ID code box wants to talk to the ECM, it grounds that circuit. And the ECM is watching uh, if you have 12 volts high or zero, zero volts low, basically in order to see the communication taking place. Um, so yeah, that's basically how the circuit works. It's kind of a cool circuit once you work with it a little bit. Uh, but yeah, so Gary, what was what were your, your readings? One was stuck at low. Yeah, the so basically IM my IMI was getting grounded continuously from the ID code box and my yeah yeah so you had also, zero volts on imi right was it correct. imi did you just say imi yeah i think so all right so you had zero volts on imi which pretty much told us either the ecm was not putting out 12 volts or the id code box was constantly grounding that circuit right correct and how i figured that out that it was doing that was i unplugged the connector at the id code box and i immediately jumped up to 12 volts this was my exactly. first time that, that's exactly how with a, uh, a mobilizer system in depth um, in like 15 years. So um, next I pulled the ECM uh, or the ID code box out um, and pulled it apart. And we had mass amounts of green crusties. So we knew it needed it. Um, customer approved it, installed it. Now I was able to communicate um, through SIL, um, through the text stream, um, and I got a new code. Um, I had B2796, no communication. I tried to program the keys, they wouldn't take. I tried to perform the handshake, uh, it failed. Um, basically the ECU and the um, ID code box wouldn't talk properly to each other. They weren't in sync. Um, I contacted Toyota technician helpline. Um, they had me redo all the tests again. Um, ended up, uh, finding that I now had communication on IMO, but not on IMI. So for some reason it was still being, um, grounded or now it wasn't being grounded at all. It was at full 12 volts all the time. Um, the B2796 pretty much leads you to the key amplifier um, or antenna, as they call it, um, that is around the key. Um, I scoped each wire. Um, the known goods here in the corner were uh, from the terminals of ECU um, picture, but every single one looked like my capture on the left. 
they all had this little pulse and then went dead. Um, so I tested everything again, checked the communication wires. Everything was fine. I got lucky that day and another 07 Highlander came in. And as soon as I put in the new antenna, I had signal on both wires. Um, I re I installed a new uh, antenna. I attempted several handshakes. It still wouldn't take. Now I was able to program keys. The security light would go off, but it still wouldn't start. Uh, at this point, you know, we're not done yet. What could cause the handshake to fail? You know, why isn't it talking properly? Um, I ended up scoping over a long time basis, kind of a zoom in the entire 30 minute handshake um, just to see if I saw anything crazy. And I really didn't. I was at my wits end at this point. Um, I talked to you guys. I talked to my FTS. I talked to TAS again. Um, I even think UPJ said, nah, there's no way that the antenna can retake out the ECU. <laughs> um, but the uh, ECU was bad again. This one got two immobilizer ECUs or ID code boxes. Um, I kind of just took a, at this point, you know, I had communication, I had powers and grounds. I pulled the ECM apart. I saw no water intrusion. It was communicating, you know, what's next. Um, I put a new a second ID code box in. Handshake was successful. Program the keys. I should have got a new good capture. I didn't. Um, so basically my belief is that water fried the IMO ECU, which fried the antenna, which fried the new IMO ECU. <laughs> And uh, found, and that's it. It's uh, it got fixed and got out of there, and everything was good. I actually had one time a security light indicator that would not let me program keys or just do anything, and I was chasing my tail, just trying to go around it. I guess there was two connectors on the Highlander that were similar, and it was a brand new harness, so you could actually plug it into the security light indicator assembly and sure enough when i looked at the at the wine diagram and i looked at the connector color one was gray and one was white and sure enough the opposite one was the one that connected to the security indicator and that gave me i was on that car for like 20 something days like it was it just I, it was horrible but yeah just a heads up if you guys ever get that tim had a good one i believe um what was it you had a 27.99 needed an id code box but when you went to do the handshake, it wouldn't accept, right? Oh, yeah, that's right. Like, this was somebody else's car. I just got pulled into it kind of at the very end. And uh, so I did the same thing that he had just talked about, where I had scoped, um, I guess, the uh, the TC circuit and IMO during the handshake. And I was able to get the TC circuit to come ungrounded during the handshake. And it ended up being a, a, there was a fuse in the fuse box that was loose and interrupting that handshake. Yeah, yeah, that was a heck of a fine. Yeah, that was weird. All right, so uh, I think I think that's it from us, right? Yeah. Any Any questions out there? Oh, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Stop. There is one more slide and it is my favorite slide. I, I have to pull it up. I got to pull it up. Got to do it. So just so you all know, I got my first official unofficial sponsors from Isaac. I told Isaac because he's such a good friend of mine that I, I would uh, allow him to sponsor me for one penny. And Isaac is such a good guy that he sent me two pennies. So he definitely gets an A plus for uh, being the best sponsor ever. Then we have uh, Kennedy's Auto Solutions. So if you know Kurt Kennedy, he used to be a Toyota tech as well. He said he's sending me a dollar to, to sponsor. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, uh, Nolan's uh, Technical College. They didn't actually sponsor me, but, you know, I'll, I'll promote them too, because why not? I'll give you a hug. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say maybe they can give me a couple of pennies as well. A virtual hug. <laughs> yeah, yeah. COVID. Well, Kurt officially sponsored my case study by selling me his Pico. 
<laughs> okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. So uh, I'm obligated to say that if anyone's looking for any autels, any Drew Tech equipment, or uh, what else does Isaac sell? Oh, his laptops. How, how did I forget his laptops? So for two pennies, giving this guy <laughs> the be- best promotion ever. So make sure you hit up uh, Isaac for any autels laptops for programming i actually have a video using one of his laptops it's pretty amazing and isaac is actually a really good friend of mine one of my favorite people so uh yeah yeah i'm throwing them up there for two pennies whether you all like it or not (laughs) all right so uh you guys have any questions so for those that are watching where's a good place for if they want to, if they want to learn how to do this, learn, learn more about. Actually, you know what? <laughs> Look, hold on one second. Look at what I, I wrote down. A channel out there about that. Where is it at? I wanted to mention this because <laughs> uh, this was kind of thrown together pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, Train by Tex has amazing videos on PicoScope usage, so make sure you go back. They have a series of videos on how to set up PicoScope, how to download it, how to save your files, how go through the train by text, uh, YouTube channel and check out their PicoScope uh, videos. Cause it's, it's pretty valuable information. And also the practical mechanic is doing weekly. Um, Nolan, I, I know you've been doing them. Maybe you can take over. I've been too busy to do them. It's kind of like weekly homework almost where he, Uh, has a video posted about how to do a test on a vehicle and you upload your waveform showing that you did it to his Facebook channel. Um, And that discusses them. It's, I mean, it starts off with, what was the first waveform? It was a starting and charging system test, right? Yeah. I think we're still kind of on that, but yeah, the first one was the uh, battery and battery cable. No, first one was just the battery. Yeah. And then it went into voltage drop on the, you know, the power side and the ground, ground side. I mean, it's, it starts off real basic, but it kind of builds on top of each, each test. So it's, it's a good way to get your feet wet with, you know, with the picoscope usage and it gives you something to work on every week. Yeah. I'm a big fan of what he's doing because a lot of people, it's hard to, eh, it's, hard, it's hard to find time. It's hard to take time to do a test unless you have a reason to. So it's giving people reasons to pull out a scope, test known good vehicles. Uh, even even just setting them up is valuable. So the more you use it, the easier it gets. Exactly, exactly. The more you use it, the faster you get with it. I'm not a big fan of uh, battery tests with a Pico scope just because I've personally had mixed results. Uh, but I know like charging system tests. Uh, did he do uh, AC? Yeah, AC he did Ripple AC. was last week. He did AC Ripple, which is a insanely valuable test. Uh, so you learn as you go. And he just said, yeah, he's slowly building up the skills uh, to more advanced tests. So definitely check out the Train by Techs for their Pico Scope uh, videos. Check out Practical Mechanic because I, I love what he's doing. I just wish I had more time uh, to post my own waveforms. I just kind of swamped over here. And there's many, many others. If you want to get more advanced, you can look at Super Mario Diagnostics. Uh, most of his scope videos are for a more advanced user. Uh, he does a lot of in-cylinder tests and secondary ignition waveform tests, stuff like that. And obviously, you have Scanner Danner, who is the OG for the YouTube diagnostician. South Main Auto has some pretty good videos. I'm sure I'm missing a lot more than that. Who else? Uh, a lot of good Pico videos on the CarQuest Technical Institute's page on YouTube. They have some oh, good yeah, videos. for sure. Isaac, you're supposed to do this. <laughs> world pack. I'm stuck on the World Pack side. Uh, yeah. We've got tons of training on the World Pack side. If you go to the World Pack website, all the one hour webinars that we did that were released for co licensing, they're all for free on the World Pack website. Not a whole lot of scope stuff there, but a lot of good educational resources that are free. Yeah. So I think that's it. Anything else? We all good? I think so. Good job, everyone.
We're good. Yeah. All good. Y'all did great. Thanks for uh great job. Thanks for hanging out, man. Maybe you for, maybe you some time you. later on we'll do this again and hopefully not completely uh destroy the first 15 <laughs> minutes of the video. Yeah, <laughs> I got a couple comments on Facebook while while there was case studies going on. I checked Facebook like, uh, this isn't working. It's like, I know. <laughs> I know. This link isn't working. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> so, all right. I guess that's it. I think Daryl's – look at Daryl. <laughs> Daryl's barely, barely awake right now. <laughs> Man, it's what time is it over there? It's after uh, 11. It, it's 11.30 oh. here. Daryl's like three Can hours I past his bedtime. Eight o'clock for me. Can I post the link in the chat? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Let's see if it went through. I just posted oh. the link to all the the free training videos from World Pack. You I'm getting the CTI ones. You may need to comment, and I might have to make you a moderator before. Um, so just leave a a comment like "Hey," and I'll make you a moderator, okay. and then I'll, you'll be allowed to post the link. I just made a comment. I don't know if it'll work or not. Mm. I don't know if you know this, but this is like the first time I've actually watched any of our friends' full YouTube video. I know. And you were on this one. But that was just because you were a sponsor. <laughs> you had to be. You had to make sure you were getting your money's worth. <laughs> <laughs> just so you all know, I'm not kidding. He literally sent me two pennies. Literally. He like Venmoed me two pennies. <laughs> <laughs> Do this Here's the CTI. Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna pop up some links in the chat, and you guys will have links to all the CTI, uh, CTI free courses as well because they're pretty phenomenal. Hey, hey, Isaac, you your comment never came through on the YouTube chat, so if you leave a comment, really, I'll make you a moderator, and you can uh, post links to the CTI training. All right, I just made a couple comments. Boom. There you go. All right. So you can post your links now. Okay. It looks like hands is all over it too. Hands is hands is coming out with these links. Yeah. On top of it. Thanks, man. All right, fellas. Well, this was fun. Maybe we'll do this again sometime. Maybe uh earlier. <laughs> earlier. <laughs> No, Nolan and uh, John, they'll still be at work. Yeah, I'll, I'll still be at work too. Yeah, you guys live in the past. You guys, gotta get with the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Well, this was fun, and I'll uh, catch you all later. <laughs>